Okay. Uh, so welcome everybody to um, one of the National uh, Counter Society uh, Zoom meetings. Uh, tonight, or this afternoon, we're going to have a lecture by Tom Cox. Um, Tom and Evelyn started the Cox Arboretum in gardens in 1990 on undeveloped acres in Canton, Georgia. Over the last 31 years, it's become a premier uh, conifer and woody plant collection in the southeastern and actually eastern United States. Uh, the Arboretum has had uh, two national conifer meetings uh, um, as a tour stop in 2002 and again in 2014. Um, uh, Tom and Evelyn have one of the country's largest collections of species conifers. Um, Tom has also been co-author of the book Conifers and Ginkgos for Southern Landscapes, uh, one of the better books on conifers, uh, specializing in conifers for the Southeast. Um, his garden is open uh, to people uh, by uh, appointment. Um, and uh, Tom is going to talk about uh, the collection of rare and endangered conifers today. Um, all yours, Tom. Well, thank you, Jeff, for that wonderful introduction. I, I was just thinking that's the second best introduction I've ever heard. The best introduction I ever heard was the time that the person that was supposed to inter introduce me got sick and I had to introduce myself. So uh, anyway, delighted to be here. Before I get started, I, I want to acknowledge two people that have played an integral role both in helping me keep this place going as well as getting prepared today. The first one is uh, our number one volunteer and ACS member, Joe Brown. And uh, Joe's a name you're gonna hear over the years. And I think Joe's got potential one day to be ACS president. And uh, he's here every week helping me uh, with this place. And without his help, uh, it would just be impossible to do what we've done. The other one is a gentleman that just came uh, long, not too long ago, Ron Stosky, who is doing drone videos for us and helping with photos. If any of you ever are interested in um, drone video work, uh, you can contact me and I can put you in touch with Ron. So with that, let me kind of dive into this. <clears throat> Rare and endangered conifers is a subject that uh, very near and dear to me. At about 2000, I had the uh, good fortune to be invited to the Bedgebury Pinatum in Kent, England. And for those of you that don't know, uh, Bedgebury is the National Conifer Collection of England and arguably the best conifer collection in the world. If you're ever over across the pond, well worth going there. So it was part of that was the inspiration for us doing this. So about um, in about 2000, we started collecting species. And I'm mindful of the fact that a lot of what I'm going to show you today are plants that uh, A, may get too big for the regular yard. Many of them are hard to obtain. So the uh, accessibility is not there. Um, and some of them are not going to live in like zone five and even zone six for some of you. Some of them will. One of the things I've observed, which has been kind of amusing is um, when you go in and you look at the literature on much of this uh, coming out of North Vietnam and parts of South Central China, some of the, uh, Mexico is Invariably, the literature shows zone nine. Even our own ACS website shows many of these plants, and we're in zone 7A, by the way, but showing those is zone nine. And that's because nobody has grown these, tested them, evaluated them, and we're finding so much of this material uh, because it's coming out of high elevations uh, is, is living here. Um, there's approximately um, about 651 conifers in the world, species of conifers, and about 34% of these uh, are endangered. So 
Uh, much of this is caused by clearing of land, things like acid rain, climate change, um, hotter areas, grazing animals, fragmentation of um, populations where they get split from each other and, and hard to reproduce. So it's uh, uh, a problem for many of these conifers and they have nowhere else to go. Many of them grow at very high elevations and there's no, no other place for them to go. So if we don't save these, many of them will become extinct in the wild. Uh, what we did find here is um, this is a very good place to grow these. Again, we're 7B, but we get about 54 inches of rain a year. The average is about 35 in the US. So we get, we get rain pretty much every month. We're at 1200 feet elevation. So we've got some elevation. Our nights do cool down. Um, and it, the plants harden off here fairly well. We don't have extreme temperatures either on either side of the thermometer. So it's a very good place to grow conifers. Another thing that kind of surprised me as we got into this was many of these plants actually need the humidity that we have here in the Southeast. So much of this coming out of subtropical areas of Asia needs heat and humidity to harden the wood off. So you take a plant that uh, will not survive well, pretty much out of zone nine in England, will grow in zone seven here because we get the heat to harden off the wood. So uh, one of the world famous uh, writers and botanists is a guy named Zoltz de Brizzi. And Zoltz uh, wrote the book Conifers Around the World. He visited, here th he visited here three times and one of his observations was that we really grow in a conifer sweet spot here for the aforementioned reasons. So we're able to do a lot. We're able to evaluate a lot and a lot of our material has been used uh, particularly with hemlocks for sharing material with various places who do breeding work. So the first plant I want to talk about, uh, well, first of all, I'm going to show you a brief video uh, done by Ryan uh, that I call Inside These Gates. What you're seeing here is starting at the gate, a lot of acers, a lot of cephalotaxis, We have a thousand foot of driveway, and it, as you can see, is filled with plants from one end to the other. And the, thing, the other thing you'll notice is that no two plants are alike. We have over 4,000 plants in the collection. And what you'll see is, other than this alley of crepe myrtles here, is most everything is a single plant. Here's our home. Around this is a big meta sequoia taxodiums, cryptomeria, all around the house, parodias. So we'll move to the next slide now. And the first one here is the rarest conifer on earth. If you're not familiar with this plant, um, it's A.B.'s Beshwan zuensis. And the fascinating part about this, when it was found in 1963, there were only seven plants that were found in the wild. And subsequently, the Chinese dug up three of these, moved them to the Beijing Botanical Garden, where they all perished, leaving four. Then one of those died in the wild. So there's only three plants uh, living today on this Beshuan Zhu Mountain in Zhejiang province in Eastern China. It is critically endangered. And we managed to get the plant through um, cuttings received from England. Uh, the plant had quite a journey. It, uh, we received the cuttings, sent them to Conifer Kingdom and Sam Pratt out in Silverton, Oregon. Sam was able to graft it on AB's firma 
and kept it for a couple of years. Then one day in the mail, we received a nice about foot and a half uh, specimen that's doing very well here. So the planet, the, the picture on the left is a stock photo showing the beautiful cones on this. The one on the right is taken from our, our plant growing here. You can see it's very healthy. Um, the, the Chinese even have a stamp of this plant, honoring this plant. Um, and it's grown from graft. So while it's endangered, obviously, in the wild, in situ, it um, is in no danger of becoming extinct because so many have been grafted. And oddly enough, for us folks here in the South, the Chinese are using Abyss firma, which is its closest ally to uh, use as understock. Next plant comes from also from China, from Fanjing Mountain in Guangzhou province. And it is Abyss Fanjing Shanensis. That's a mouthful, Abyss Fanjing Shanensis. I had to practice that a few times before giving this presentation. So it is uh, growing in a very remote area, uh, hard to get to there, difficult to access. Uh, so um, no danger of agricultural encroachment, but its main uh, nemesis is um, acid rain. So there's about 2,500 trees in the last uh, census taken. And um, it was, uh, I was introduced to the plant. I was over in Western Hungary visiting with actually Zolf de Brezi and came across this plant in a private collection that he had taken me to. Uh, it was kind of late in the year, but uh, the folks said, you may be able, they looked at the growth and they said, you may be able to get some viable cuttings out of this. I took some cuttings, was able to get it back to, again, to Sam Pratt, who was able to um, get the plant going. This, I'm sure, was the first introduction of this species into North America. In fact, we were told at the time I collected it that the Chinese did not want this plant out. It's just a very rare plant. And I believe for you folks that uh, are interested in furs and can grow a large fur, this has a lot of ornamental characteristics. You can see the still model markings on the abaxal side of the leaf there. It's very ornamental. It looks like it grows very quickly. And um, I would say it probably goes on down to zone five. I'm comfortable with that zone five would be okay. Its closest ally would be Abyss forgesia. So the next plant we're gonna look at is Fokinia and some authorities rate this. Waiting for the slide to come up. So rate this, or today classify this as Camisiparis hagensii. We don't subscribe to that here. I think the morphological differences are such that this warrants genus status. Uh, the ACS today has this as Camisiparis. Again, I don't agree with that. Um, it uh, is a threatened conifer that uh, comes out of southeastern China. It's uh, monotypic, meaning it only has one species. Um, so the timber in this plant was uh, formerly used for coffins. As a matter of fact, the common name of this plant was called coffin wood. The roots were also used as an essential oil in aromatherapy. And the Chinese actually take the uh, green foliage and put it uh, on fires to smoke their wood. Probably zone seven, it lives uh, two provinces in China and uh, into um, North Vietnam. We have plants actually from North Vietnam accessions as well as plants from China. I think the ones from Vietnam probably are a little hardier, the leaf's a little more narrow, and I think ornamentally probably a little superior. Uh, you'll notice also the stomatal marking on the backside of the leaf there, very fascinating. And so you'll see a lot of these Asian plants with this very good stomatal marking. Um, 
So the next plant, again, I think I mentioned this, but it's zone seven, probably depending on the provenance. The next one, Joe, okay, is Pseudotaxus chini. I'm not gonna say a lot about this one uh, in the interest of time. It's called the white berry yew. And you can see the reasons why it's called white berry yew. Um, it um, is used in China as an ornamental plant, but um, again, interesting stomatal marking on the backside. Um, so Pseudotaxus chinii is just one of these obscure plants. You're not gonna see very often. Again, probably hardy at least into zone six, if not five. Um, not gonna get real big and also one that will grow in shade. Um, okay, Joe, the next slide, please. If I were going to recommend one, one plant for ornamental uh, purposes, it would be this one. This is Cephalotaxis lanceolata. The big slide you see here is a stock photo with the others being from our collection here. This is again, a one that came from a private collection in England. I have never seen this plant anywhere in North America or anywhere except in my travels in China. It just was not around anywhere. Uh, it's endangered. It was exploited for its timber. That's one of the big things. It only comes from one location in Northwest Yunnan, China. So it's, it's very restricted area. There's only about 2,500 mature plants left in the world. Um, grows to about 20 feet. And those leaves, each of those leaves are about six inches long. And you'll see they taper to a point, hence the name Lanceolata. Um, interesting stomata markings on the back again. Uh, highly adaptable to shade, but this, my friends and folks like Alan Solomon and others out there, uh, this would be one, if you could find it, would be well worth growing. Um, the next one is Amentotaxis unanonensis. This is a genus you may not be familiar with. The Mentotaxis, there's about five to six species of this, most of them growing in China, Laos, and North Vietnam. Uh, Unanonensis is very restricted. Uh, probably uh, zone seven. The biggest threat here again is logging. Uh, occurs in the same area pretty much where Fokinia is. And we thought at one time that it was in high risk of extinction and then they have found some additional populations. So it's now vulnerable. Also of interest is the fact that uh, there may be an anti-cancer drug associated with this. The, the studies right now are promising that uh, like the drug Taxol from the Pacific U, uh, this may have properties that uh, show some promise in slowing cancer cells down. This is one that definitely needs the summer heat and humidity of the Southeast to prosper. I would doubt that it would do real well out on the West Coast uh, where they lack so much humidity. Um, the next one is a plant that we just got a couple of years ago, and it's one of the most recently discovered conifers on earth, Amento Texas Hyutuensis. And this was only found in North Vietnam. I saw pictures of the plant uh, in the wild and the trees were so large, you couldn't even get your arms around them. Um, it was only described in 1996. So it's, it's relatively new. Um, it uh, was collected by uh, folks at the Atlanta Botanical Garden, along with Dan Hinckley, uh, whose name many of you are familiar with. And again, notice on the backside, you've got these real long leaves and interesting stomato markings with the green band in the center. Um, we have this planted in a protected place. I only have one plant and um, it was in the ground last summer. Not sure how hardy it's going to be last summer was not a not a great test, but um, 
we will probably cover it up this year if it gets real cold. But uh, again, one of the, you're seeing one of the most interesting and uh, recently introduced conifers on earth. All right, next slide, please. I see a Martinezia. Uh, uh, this is only known from six stands. So we've traveled all the way from Asia. Now we're in the Nuevo Leon area uh, along the Sierra Madre uh, Oriental in um, Mexico. And this plant is critically endangered. Um, it's the most endangered plant in Mexico and one of the most endangered conifers in the world. Um, it's very similar to another species growing in Mexico called Pasilla Chihuahuana, which we had received years ago from um, good folks up in uh, um, Northeast. So uh, we suspect this is going to be at least zone six, maybe zone five plant. But some interesting facts about this one, it, it grows only, I said, in six locales. There's uh, only about 250 plants left in the wild. And the elevation it grows at is about six to 7,000 feet. Now, at one time, this plant lived at a much lower elevation. They found pollen grains down in the valleys. Um, so what you're looking at is post-glacial plants that migrated up the mountain and stayed there. And those that um, were lower elevations were wiped out by the uh, last glaciations on earth. So the plant was only discovered in 1981. So again, a relatively new conifer. It's uh, been uh, critically endangered by logging and also by fire. So I say again, at least seven, maybe six. Okay, next slide. If I had to choose one plant that I would most not want to lose in the collection of rare conifers. This would be Toria jackii. Not to brag, but I've been in 51 countries and been to most all of the major arboreta in those countries and many private gardens. I have only seen this plant one time in Western Hungary at the International Dendrology Institute in Budakesi, Hungary. And it's the only place I've ever seen this plant. The first two photos there are stock photos showing you how beautiful this plant can look and the last photos taken here of our specimen, which is about five feet tall. Along with the Cephalotaxis lanceolata that just showed you a moment ago, Joe and his son actually moved this plant to a more desirable location. So fingers crossed that we don't lose it. Um, it's not like any other terrea in the world and uh, it's just very different with this long leaf. It's more like Cephalotaxis lanceolata than it is any other terrea. Um, it grows in the general area where we showed you the first slide there of Abes Beshwan zuensis. This plant will grow to at least zero degrees. So it's, 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 it will take some cold. Well worth searching out if you could find it. And next one. <clears throat> it's really not a rare plant. This is the only one, well, I say rare, it's a rare plant, but it's the only one that's not endangered. I included this plant because it's one that you likely uh, don't know or haven't seen. Uh, when I was at Bedgeberry, I came across this plant at Wakehurst Palace and also at Bedgeberry. And I was just so struck by this weeping spiral branches and I searched for over 10 years to find it and two years ago I found a friend in France who happened to have the tree and he arranged us in cuttings and again via Sam Pratt we were able to get it grafted it's grafted on the Pasea bees and so the plant on the right is actually our plant but um this uh, sure is one of very few growing in North America. I did see this plant, a very poor specimen growing at the UC Berkeley Botanical Garden. But again, it was in very poor condition. And um, so we're hopeful this plant's gonna really take off 
and uh, become a nice specimen here one day. Okay, next, Joe. Is Texas Floridana. This is a very endangered endemic to Florida, as the name Floridana would suggest. It's only endemic to Florida along about a six mile area along the Apalachicola River. It's kind of co dominant around there with another plant that's in the next slide, another Terea. But this plant, um, also contain, contains taxol, like taxol brevifolia. And taxol, once again, at one time was used um, to treat cancer. Um, it was used so much and overharvested that they did finally find a synthetic alternative. And so we're no longer, thank goodness, um, using use for taxol. This one was never collected because there were so few of them available. But um, it is um, just a beautiful plant that, um, so growing this, you're growing a very rare plant. And I think this would probably go into zone six as well, even though it's, it's growing in Florida. Next, please. Okay, this is Terea taxifolia. This has got a, one of the most fascinating histories to me of any conifer that we grow, period. Uh, again, this plant only lives along about a 20, uh, it's about a 40 mile stretch of the Apalachicola River Basin along the Alabama, Georgia, Florida line. And at one time, this plant would have been growing up in the, in the Southern Appalachian Mountains it migrated, whether it was migra migration caused by glaciation or had something that moved it down either water or some large mammal that took the seed down to Florida where it stayed, uh, it became extinct in the Appalachia. We do know this plant is hardy all the way up into Pennsylvania. So at one time it did have a much Northern provenance than now. So plants today have been moved and are growing up in, uh, as I said, uh, Connecticut, uh, New York, Pennsylvania. But the plant uh, has a disease that is causing a stem canker. And when it gets a couple of feet high, uh, it dies back, much like the American chestnut tree. So this wilt or disease was actually discovered in the 50s, but was only recently described by Dr. Jason Smith at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Uh, and so um, it is something we're no cure for, and they're moving it around to various places. But in the wild, it's... Uh, very endangered. There's less than 1% of this plant left from the original population. Um, it's one of the oldest plants in North America. Uh, if, from fossil remains, they've dated this about 165 million years ago. Okay, I would say again, zone six, at least probably five. Okay. Glyptostrobus <clears throat> pencilis. This is one of the five deciduous conifers on earth. Uh, one of the first things you'll notice is the name Glyptostrobus and kind of the root of, of Metasequoia glyptostroboides. When Metasequoia was first discovered, they really thought they had found a species of Glyptostrobus or <laughs> Some thought sequoia, other things. They weren't sure what they actually found when they found metasequoia. Uh, they just knew they had a plant that was only described from fossil remains. So uh, Glyptostrobus uh, was growing. So, that, so Glyptostroboides took its name from Glyptostrobus. We have uh, two very nice plants of this. And one, uh, both of these, the one on the left, it's a drone shot that Ryan took. The one on the right is growing here, and that's one called woolly mammoth. 
that came to us years ago from uh, Yadkin Valley Nursery in Yadkinville, North Carolina. It's a registered conifer, the National Arboretum uh, agrees it's a different uh, clone. It's a, a, little, a little more uh, glaucous and it's a better habit to it. This particular one, the bear has actually climbed it and broke the top out. And it's so what you're seeing is second, second uh, growth on that. Um, it's a uh, fascinating tree um, to uh, look at. It's critically endangered. It only grows, it's maybe extinct in China, by the way. Uh, the ones that you're finding today naturally are in Laos in North Vietnam. Uh, they use it along the banks of rice paddies to stabilize the banks. Um, first time I saw this plant was at the National Arboretum in Washington, DC. It was an old scraggly looking thing that I didn't think much of. I subsequently found it really needs to be near a water source to prosper. You cannot stick this plant out in a dry area and expect much from it. It, it, will, it will grow at least in zone five. But again, needs the water. It's closely allied with taxodium. It does, even though I've never seen the news here, the literature does suggest that it does grow the, uh, or does produce new metaphors or the, or the knees that we classically see on taxodium. Um, but um, it's very seldom seen in North America. Probably the best one I've ever seen was in a garden in, in Sydney, Australia. Uh, one well, well worth searching out. Okay, Joe. Okay, another one that's got an interesting history. There's a little island uh, off the, of, which is about 80 miles off the mainland of Korea called Oolongdu Island. And Oolongdu, uh, I said about 80 miles from the mainland of Korea and about 176 miles from the west coast of Japan. That's a little volcanic island of, a, of about 28 miles square. And um, it's had vegetation for about 1.7 million years. The island's been vegetated. And it's got a high degree of endemism on there where there's plants that only live on that island and nowhere else. Much like all the conifer endemism that's found in New Caledonia. So this plant at one time obviously grew in Korea. And then with the glaciations, um, it found a warm climate due to the oceanic currents and uh, on this Oolongdu Island and sort of a glacial refugium, if you will, where it lived and it lived no other place. For the longest time, the plant was thought to be uh, Suga Sibodia, which is a Southern Japanese hemlock. Most of you are familiar with that one probably. Um, but it came about that the uh, Arnold Arboretum along with some others were searching for a hemlock that had some resistance to the woolly adelogid, which has decimated many of our Eastern Suga Carolina and Suga Canadensis hemlocks here in the East Coast. So they knew all of this hemlock and they brought it back, but they weren't sure what they'd found and looked at it and they said, well, it's Suga Sibodii, also closely allied with the Northern Japanese form diversifolia. And then someone figured out, no, this is a different species. So they looked at the DNA of the material and determined, yeah, this is in fact a new species, which was described and accepted as a species in 2017. That's a big deal, folks. You know, you think about just 2017, we've got a new conifer species. Um, a lot of plants, uh, it's not unusual to find new species or even new genera uh, in the angiosperms, but in gymnosperms, it's very, very rare that you find anything anymore that is new. Uh, you may find subspecies or some subpopulation, but to find a new species is a big deal. Uh, so it was accepted in 2017. Uh, previous to that, 
The last one that was described was way back in 2002, and that was the Cupressus vietnamensis, first named Xanthocyparus uh, vietnamensis from Vietnam. So all the way from 2002 to 2017, there was no, no conifers introduced. Um, and now you have the Amentotexas that I just talked about earlier. Okay, Joe. Oh, by the way, those pictures, they're all from here. Now, this is a plant from Mexico. Again, this is one I had only seen in America. At, uh, in fact, the only ones I've ever seen were at the UC, UC Berkeley Botanical Garden. They've got a great Mexican collection of pines and other conifers in there. And never expected it to be hardy here, and I'm not sure how hardy it's going to be. The one on the left is a stock photo, just to show you how beautiful this thing can be. The one on the right is from here, again, in a protected area. Uh, it lives in Guatemala, San Sal uh, El Salvador, Mexico, um, and Colombia. Um, so we are testing it out. This will be its second winter to go through, and um, we'll probably cover it up. Because plants like this are hard to find. You're just not going to walk out there every day and find Podocarpus matude. Okay, Joe. Last slide is again one of these that has this very interesting history. Uh, most of you probably know this. It was found, uh, only found in 1994. And some folks were hiking down into a canyon uh, not too far from Sydney. They came up on a plant, and luckily one of the people in the party uh, was an amateur uh, botanist and um, recognized that he'd found something here that nobody really could identify. So they brought it back. Pretty much the rest is history. They, did, they found out that it was a plant growing in uh, fossil remains uh, from about 200 million years ago, making it one of the uh, actually oldest conifers on earth. And I will point out that um, conifers from the southern hemisphere tend to be older than conifers from northern hemisphere. It's a fact many people don't, don't think about, but when you go down and look at the Araucarias, uh, here's the Wallamai and some others, they actually are more ancient than uh, our conifers in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and it's been fascinating to me how they stay south of the, south of the equator. And, and uh, pines, as an example, only travel in the Northern Hemisphere. And there's one pine that goes about two degrees into Sumatra, Pinus mercusii. But this Wallama, um, there's not with less than a hundred of them left in this one little canyon. So think about uh, this plant was one footstep away from some foreign pathogen that would wipe it out with no natural immunity. Uh, a couple of years ago, they had the fire in 1990 and 2000 in 2020, a big fire in Australia, and they were really concerned about losing this plant. And they went to great lengths to uh, get fire in there and retardants and covers and actually save this plant. Um, it's hardy to about 23 degrees. When it plant first came. Uh, came on the scene. I wrote to the experts in Australia and got a, some correspondence back and they said it's about 23 degrees. The other problem with this, as well as a number of southern hemisphere conifers, is root rut or Phytophthora cinnamoma. And we have to drench this plant. What you're looking at here, are, these are both our, our specimens but we have to actually drench this plant uh, to keep it alive. So I think what happens here when it gets cold, it's weakened by the phytophthora or root rot. So it's already in decline, it's not a healthy plant. Then you throw in the cold and you've got a plant that's uh, DRT or dead right there. Um, the other thing about this plant that uh, 
uh, you should know is that uh, it uh, <clears throat> will, I said, we'll, we'll live uh, pretty well here, but um, successive temperatures below 23 weakens it and it eventually will die. So um, that's, uh, I think, Joe, that's the last one. Okay, so um, again, these are all, to me, very fascinating plants. You can see many of them got the very long needles, interesting stomata markings on the back. Um, most of them come from areas where there's high rainfall. Um, and if we don't protect these, uh, and, and if the ACS, uh, you know, let's face it, most of us have been focused due to the size of our yards and availability of, of cultivars, we focus on small and dwarf plants. Uh, but part of our mission as the American Conifer Society is preservation and conservation. So I hope this presentation today has aided in your awareness of these plants out there and how rare and precious they are. And if they go away, it's like the passenger pigeon or the Tasmanian tiger uh, or dodo bird, they're gone forever. And um, we don't know what compounds are left in there. So with that folks, I'm gonna bring this to a close and I uh, can't read that. Joe, what's your saying? <clears throat> says Tom from Sarah Malone. Says Tom, is anyone propagating woolly now sexually? All I hear about is asexual propagation, and that means very small gene pool. Um, well, the first first the gene pool was small itself, uh, Sarah, with only about a hundred known trees. There were several populations, so it was not just one population. Uh, short answer is, I don't know of. Um, if, if that's going on, I'm sure it is. Um, one thing I did want to mention is some places where it's warm, like down in Florida, they're actually grafting this onto uh, some aracarias that are like aracaria and gustifolia, which uh, is not so susceptible to phytophorus and ammonia. But um, that's a good question, Sarah. I don't know, but you're right. It is a limited gene pool. Just run that uh, video straight out of the media player. So okay. it, it, it was choppy when it, when it was on there. So Hello. Uh, that was a great presentation, Tom. Uh, there's one in the chat. Does anybody else? Oh, yeah. Tom, there's another question about uh, hardiness zone for Cephalotaxis lanceolata. I'm guessing the Lanceolata again is probably zone five. Does anybody else have any questions for Tom? You can unmute or raise your hand or put it in chat. Yeah, Tom, uh, you can let him know we're going to share that video again. It should run smoother. We're going to run this video again. And Joe was just saying it should run smoother here. Okay. Uh, glad to answer any questions or any or any commentary you've got or any any anything at all you want to talk about. Tom, that was uh, not. This is not a question, but just wanted to comment. That was a fascinating presentation, and uh, so thank you for that. Well, I appreciate that. Who was that talking? Uh, Steve Cronkite from Connecticut. Oh, thank you, Steve. I appreciate you saying so. Uh, yes, yeah, some of these are going to work up your area. And uh, yeah, I was I was keeping notes on the hardiness uh, for them all. So uh, I'm curious whether you know any source for the uh, the hemlock. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, if, I'm if you know if you know of a source, uh, uh, you know a commercial source for the the hemlock. Oh, the uh, Ulangensis. Yes. Uh, we got ours from the Arnold Arboretum. Again, we different different category than yeah. Uh, being able to get things. I don't, it's likely, um, uh, let me say this, anybody that wanted material, uh, I'd be happy to send material. This, this would root, I think, fairly easily. Uh, all right. So um, 
something to keep in mind if somebody wanted to try some of these. Um, it's one more thing I, I did want to mention also, you know, where we grow here, as opposed to say Sarah Milan, uh, is our soil is pretty acidic. That's based on the amount of rainfall we get causes our soil to become more acidic. But um, a lot of these plants are growing uh, on karst limestone. And we are finding that when we plant these, and pretty much every conifer that we plant now, irrespective of where it comes from, uh, as Joe would tell you, uh, we have a bag of powdered uh, lime in, the, in our four wheel, and we mix lime into the foil, uh, soil. I think some of these plants are lime tolerant, as a, I mean, or, or acid tolerant, as opposed to acid loving. So, um, even, even things that love acid supposedly like uh, rhododendron, we're putting lime in there and slow release fertilizer. So um, we, we spent a lot of time before I put a plant in the ground, I'm looking at latitudinally where it's living. The elevation's a big thing. I said, you know, Mexico was a good example where Mexico, you think about it as being flat and hot and Clint Eastwood like, uh, in the old spaghetti movies, but uh, Mexico has higher mountains than any mountain east of the Mississippi River. Our highest mountain is at Mount Mitchell, North Carolina. And Mexico has mountains almost four times as high as, as, high as Mount Mitchell. So get a lot of snow load. Um, so they'll take temperatures beyond what uh, we believe they will take going back and one of the things I'm gonna be talking to the ACS about is y'all need to be getting with us here and revising some of your zone uh, declarations on, on the ACS websites. Okay. Tom, did you wanna run the video again? Yeah, here we go. Let's see the place over here. Well, uh, what we're doing now, let me let me also extend an invitation. Uh, Evelyn and I joked that we've at one time or another housed overnight half the American Conifer Society. And uh, uh, Always happy to have visitors here. Got another fine gentleman here right now, Lauren, uh, who was a recent ACS member. He just joined to hear this presentation. And he came over from Athens, Georgia, and sitting here with us. And uh, say hi, Lauren. Howdy, folks. Now, Lauren's brand new. He's only a couple of weeks into the ACS. And so, Jeff, these talks, not just this one, but others are a I think a good recruitment tool. All right, anything else? Thank you, Tom, for a wonderful presentation and for all that you've done to save conifers. Well, thank you, Alan, you doing okay? Yes, thank you. Hope the same to you. Regards to you and Evelyn. Well, same up your way, friend. Um, I, uh, the other day, uh, in fact, Joe Brown, who I mentioned as b being so integral to this place now, I uh, was telling him about your place. And next time he's in Knoxville, I'm going to give him your number. That would be wonderful. Yeah, he'd need to see it. And um, Alan, if you don't know, folks, Alan's got one of the better conifer collections out there um, of, of anyone, him and Andrea. And uh, so... Uh, Anybody else want to say hi or anything? Or if not, I'll let everybody go and wish you a great day. And thanks for tuning in. Thank you again, Tom. Uh, just want to let everybody know we're going to have um, uh, between four and eight lectures uh, on Saturday, starting the second week in January. 
and extending into the third week in February. Um, we'll have more information about those later. Uh, the ones in January are going to be uh, reference gardens from the central region, and the ones in February, uh, one's going to be from Elmer Dustman on cloud pruning uh, techniques. Uh, one's going to be uh, from Jerry Crawl on container gardening with conifers. Um, and then the third one uh, in February, we're still uh, picking a date and a topic, but uh, we should be able to stay warm and cozy with lots of conifer talks um, coming up in the middle of winter. So stay tuned. Well, Jeff, thank you. I know this is a time bandit for you to have to have to put these on and uh, it's uh, much appreciated. Thank you. Hope everybody is enjoying them. We'll have more in the fu near future. <laughs> All right, sign it off. Oh, if you uh, guys miss any of the lectures, um, we're putting all the lectures on uh, the ACS YouTube channel. Uh, so you'll be able to find them on YouTube uh, within a few days after the lecture if you miss them, as well as all the previous ones. Thank you, Thank you all. Appreciate you coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.